You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hey, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the Common Descent Podcast for episode 71. 71. 71. This episode, we are discussing a topic that will get us into geology a little bit. Ooh, rocks. And earth history and broad extinct ecosystems. <laughs> the Western Interior Seaway. This one's exciting because I don't, I know what this is, but I don't know a lot about it. So I think a lot of our listeners might be saying, oh, cool, the Western Interior Seaway. And a lot of other listeners might be saying, what? The Western Interior where? Why, the who now? So, for those who are unfamiliar, the quick version is, during the Cretaceous period, largely in the Cretaceous period, the when the dinosaurs roamed and mosasaurs swam the seas and such, North America was bisected by the ocean. Yeah, it was it was split in half. It was. And indeed, if you go to, if you look for Cretaceous rocks, particularly late Cretaceous, but very famously, in North America, like, it's dinosaurs on land in Alberta, and in far to the west, and in New Jersey, and in the eastern states, but in, like, Kansas, it's ocean. Mm -hmm. Because the sea level, through a variety of, uh, of, of reasons that we will get into later, flooded North America. The most extensive flooding of North America in the last around 300 million years or so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a significant environment that was present here in North America that... I feel like it just gets looked over a lot of the time, especially for how many things talk about dinosaurs. Don't point out that our map would be blue in yeah. the middle of it. <laughs> so in this episode, we're going to talk about how that happened, what the effects were, what lived in the ocean. And because this was also requested, we're going to dedicate a good chunk of this episode to discussing the two half continents yeah. that were formed by this intrusion. Two continents, Laramidia to the west and Appalachia to the east, each with their own unique ecosystems. Pretty cool. This episode was requested, all the requests, by Avana and Joel, and also by patrons Mark and Colleen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good request. But before we get to the topic, as long-term listeners know, we have to do the news. And before we can do the news, we have announcements. Announcements. It's October. It is. Which means two things. Number one, every month is a great opportunity for us to remind our listeners that this podcast is supported in large part by our patrons. Yep. If you'd like to support us, you can check us out on Patreon. Subscribers at various levels get all sorts of goodies. Like you'll, we, we've been doing director's notes lately mm -hmm. for each episode. Mm -hmm. Um, most of our subscribers on Patreon get access to bonus audio content, like bonus news at higher levels. We'll send you presents. We'll do cool things for you. We'll answer your questions on the podcast. We'll also shout your name out. Yeah. And indeed this episode, we would like to welcome Quinn. Welcome Quinn. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for the support. The other exciting thing about October <laughs> is it means, and this will already have happened, by the time this episode comes out, Spooky is back. Yes. Spooculative evolution, where we take a speculative evolution look at some of our favorite monsters. Yeah, some of history's best creepy creatures. Last year, when we started Spooky, we looked at classic horror movie monsters, mm -hmm. vampires, werewolves, and so on. This year, our theme is monsters of Greek mythology. Yeah, some of the longest lasting monsters. And indeed, by the time this episode comes out, we will already have released the first episode, which is us speculatively evolu uh, evolutionizing. <laughs> and that, that. <laughs> Harpies. Harpies! So check it out and enjoy. Yeah, it was fun. And I believe that's all the announcements. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Well, that means it's time to go on to the news. <gasps> Yay! Every episode, we pick some news from the news and from the paleontology, earth history, all sorts of cool stuff. So that we stay up to date, you stay up to date, gives us some extra things to talk about. Will, what news have you brought today? I want to talk about a new identified species of crocodile. What? Yeah. Crocodile. All right, well, 
I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler. I will mention Crocodilians later in the episode. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> now, this is uh, an interesting bit of news because it's not an old, well, not too old, not an old crocodile. It's one that's around today. Oh. Yes. This is about the New Guinea crocodile. Okay. Yeah. So this is research done by Christopher Murray et al. in Copia. And the article we're linking to is by Ashley Strickland in CNN. So uh, the New Guinea crocodile, for anyone who doesn't know it, is a medium-sized, you know, 10-ish foot, you know, basically alligator-sized uh, crocodile that's found in Papua New Guinea, north of Australia. And it was discovered in 1928. But it's notable because it, it its population is split between two halves of the island due to a mountain range. Uh, That goes to the middle and splits north and south. Well, in 1989, Philip Hall noticed this, studied those two populations, and noticed some differences. Behavioral differences, for the most part, that seemed to make those two populations distinct. Things like nesting and mating behavior were notable between the two groups. And he was working toward identifying them as separate species when he died. Oh. So he was not able to actually conclude the full aspect of this research. Only part of, you know, only some of the publications, you know, of what he fully wanted to describe were published. Fast forward to nowadays, where the new team of researchers heard about this research at a conference. And basically, the people talking about it were asking for help to revisit this study, revisit these two groups and see if indeed they are two different species. The team brought in morphological data uh, to add to Hall's behavioral observations, and they looked at skulls. Specifically, they analyzed 51 skulls from seven different museum collections. Okay. And these skulls did show distinct population differences between the North and the South. So now we have behavioral, morphological, and there are some genetic studies that seem to support this as well. And with that data, they were even able to go to the St. Augustine alligator farm, which we've mentioned before in other crocodile studies. Yeah. It's the best. (laughs) Where they have New Guinea crocs, and they were able to recognize the crocs by the features. Oh, so they were able to look and say, that's a northern That one. should that's... be a northern croc, that should be a southern croc, oh. and one of the skulls, the uh, alligator farm had a skull on site. They were able to identify it to the river system. Wow. It came from. Oh, <laughs> cool. So this is, these features are distinct. They're not vague. They're not, you know, blurry line between the two. It's fairly distinct uh, morphological features, which led them to naming a new species for the southern population. So the northern population is still Crocodilus novigineus, which is the New Guinea crocodile. The southern portion is Crocodilus halli, named after Philip Hall. Oh. Yeah. That's a nice tied up little scientific story. It's real, And one of the researchers said that this was an extremely meaningful bit of study for them because not only did they get to finish up a piece of research by a very important researcher within crocodilian studies but also to connect his name to it which is very cool that is very cool wow hey listeners keep in mind that when you split a landmass in two things change yes that'll be important later (laughs) also and that is something else that i can reference back to later the idea of a researcher dying before they get to finish the research they were working on is really it's a fascinating thing that absolutely happens in fact i wrote about an example of this uh, a couple of years ago uh paleontologist rebecca hunt foster whom you've heard before if you listen to our diversity in paleo episode did the similar thing not too long ago where she picked up research that had been dropped off a dinosaur specimen that was on its way to probably being named as a new species and then the guy who was researching it passed away yeah and that ended up be and, and ended up keeping the name that he had come up with. Like it had been this colloquial name, but it wasn't official. They called it Arkansaurus, which is an awesome dinosaur name. And then ended up later publishing it. And then and I think they didn't. She didn't name it after him because he had already colloquially named it after the guy who found it. But she put him on as a posthumous co-author. Oh, that's cool. Which is pretty cool. 
So it's it, it's a fun to see how scientists choose to celebrate and memorialize the those who came before them. Absolutely, and uh, this study is also cool because it n- makes notable the importance of museum collections. Is mm-hmm. one of the things that the researchers really stressed because they were able to do this research purely from collections without having to a travel to Papua New Guinea, which would have been expensive, or b collect specimens there. Right. which is difficult and time-consuming and expensive. And so this really allowed them to do a lot, especially considering some of these skulls were up to 90 years old from the collections. Wow. So they were almost century-old skulls that they were looking at that had been safe in these collections the whole time. And now this may redefine the conservation status of one or both of these species if looking at them as separate populations shows one is in a different uh danger of you know habitat loss or you know some other conservation effect wow. very important yeah. results very cool so one more crocodile Woo. well since your first news bit talked about things that aren't even old enough to be fossils yet i will start out with some news about the oldest fossils in the world wow this is research by Raphael Baumgartner et al. in the journal Geology, and we'll link to an article at Science Alert by Michelle Starr. If you ask around and try to look up what are the oldest fossils in the world, you'll see a lot of numbers and a lot of different possible, maybe, fossils, but the most consistent result you will see is three and a half billion year old stromatolites from Western Australia. Stromatolites are structures that are formed from mats of bacteria. So you get this sort of bacterial colony that, that essentially is going to make like a goo that's sitting on the, 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 the shallow sea floor, And then that layer of bacteria will kind of cement in place and a new generation will grow on top of it. And then again and again, and you get these layers of cemented sediment left behind by these bacterial mats. It's the same way that coral reefs build up over time, just mm-hmm. it's bacteria doing it. At 3.5 billion years old, the (laughs) oldest stromatolites in the world are also the oldest generally accepted evidence of life. There are other suggestions of, you know, possible life older, some things that have been suggested, some things that have been shot down, some things that are kind of still hanging in the air. But a stromatolite is a fossil, and these are the oldest generally agreed upon fossils in the world, discovered Way back in the 80s, it's been very exciting because we've had this sort of number to throw out. However, as these authors point out, even though the scientific community generally accepts that these are the oldest fossils, it hasn't been conclusively proven through multiple lines of evidence. Hmm. Morphologically, look like stromatolites, and that's been good enough. They wanted to go in and say, well, can we shore it up? Like, can we confirm it using multiple methods? So that's what they aim to do. In this study, they looked for, they, they went out and they found drill core samples. I don't believe they took the samples, but previously cored samples from the stromatolites that could give them a look under the surface. Because one of the things that you end up with is that at the surface, you can get weathering and that can change the shape and that can really sort of adjust what you're seeing in your fossil. And morphological evidence, shape and structure, has been how they were identified as stromatolites. So they wanted to kind of get past all the the maybe areas of confusion and got down to these exceptionally preserved layers under the surface. Then they conducted a whole variety of analyses on them. They looked under the microscope. They did spectroscopic analysis, so chemical analysis. They did stable isotope analysis, comparing the what versions of elements you have, and they found a bunch of handy positive results. They found that the structure of the stromatolites is full of porous pyrite, which is consistent with sulfidation of an organic-dominated matrix, which is to say, this is what it looks like when an organic-dominated sediment ends up being fossilized. Cool. Plus one for organics. They also found under the microscope these strands and filaments, the microscopic strands and filaments that are consistent with what we see in films of microbes, plus another one for organic remains. And when they looked at the carbon isotopes in the stromatolites, they found that the carbon ratios they see are the same sort of ratios you see in organic remains as opposed to inorganic sources of carbon. So that is three independent analysis results that all point to yeah these are legitimate fossils of stromatolites cool yeah it's the it's one of those things where like we already thought that was the case 
but now to have it sort of yeah, now we have confirmed it several times over. We don't have to argue. Now we can point at all this evidence and know that we were right about it. Yeah, well, it's it's uh, why they don't just run one test for new medicines. They run multiple, multiple, multiple redundant tests to make sure that they've confirmed from as many angles as they can. Right. What they saw the first time is accurate. And it's, it's not always the exciting research because it's coming up with the answer of, yeah, no, that thing we thought was what we thought. Yep. But it's important because it means that we're not accidentally making assumptions that make sense and are logical, but wrong. Yeah, it's, it's the kind of study that's the the sort of final result is not very exciting. Nothing mm-hmm. has changed. But yeah, like you said, it's very important to be double checking ourselves. It's what allows us down the road to look back and have this as ironclad yeah. You know, quote unquote, iron clad, <laughs> <Hyperite evidence>. clad. <laughs> iron sulfide clad. <laughs> <laughs> nice. S- uh, foundation to stand upon for future research. You know, right. it's why we don't have to confirm gravity every time. Yes. Because we've done all the gravity analysis we know how to do so far. I mean, I'm sure there's a physicist out there right now going, no, we haven't. But, <laughs> but we know what we, you know, we have the foundation. We've done the calculations from multiple angles at multiple elevations of Earth's <laughs> atmosphere. So we understand what gravity should be unless something really weird happens. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. And it's, this is a fun one. Headline worthy and indeed got a headline. Because it's the oldest fossils on the planet, which is real fun. This is an important one for us to be sure on. Like, this isn't just like us double-checking the age of a random dinosaur. This is us double-checking our oldest known confirmed evidence of life. Yep. That's a date we want to have pretty locked in. And a lot of other possible evidences of super, super ancient life have been shown to be incorrect it's mm-hmm. like all right we thought this might be life and then when we took a closer look it was not so having a confirmation is real nice yes it is cool well my next bit of news is not uh you know fossil based as in it's studying an organism but it's fossil soil looking at how our atmospheres used to be oh yeah we're getting weird this episode yeah this is news i like it we're reaching out this one's a fun one i really like this <laughs> we one. we haven't talked about vertebrate fossils yet Ooh, yeah good point yeah yeah. Look at us branching out. <laughs> only a took new a 71 podcast. episodes. <laughs> <laughs> We're late bloomers. <laughs> this news piece is about what it seems carbon levels in the atmosphere were compared to today. That what they are today is very different from what they've been for quite a while. I could see why that might be important. Yeah. This is research by Jawe Da et al. in Nature Communications. The article is by Leslie Lee in Texas A&M Today. So this is looking at CO2 levels in the atmosphere. CO2 is the famous greenhouse gas that we everyone hears about all the time nowadays. Uh, but it's you know a natural gas in our atmosphere, and it you know for the most part has been for a very very long time in Earth's history. But its levels have changed. So the amount of average CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up, and it's measured by parts per million. So parts of CO2 per million, you know, molecule of atmos- uh, of air that you're measuring. Right. All the other oxygen, nitrogen, yeah, all the other stuff. all the other junk <laughs> that you're not interested in. Well, this study's found that the CO2 levels that we see today are higher than they have been for the last two and a half million years. Ooh. Which includes all of human history. So this is notable because we we know, we know, dear listeners, yep. that CO2 levels now are higher than they have been for recorded history. Yes. And higher than they've been for thousands and yes. indeed hundreds of thousands of years from other data. This, that is a big pushback. Because the previous uh, gold standard, as they put it, were ice cores. Right. Ice cores are an amazing way to, to look at previous atmosphere because it traps bubbles of atmosphere from those times but that only typically goes back about 800,000 years right which is a long time that's pretty good but that was kind of our the limit to our view for how the atmosphere has changed this is pushing it back millions of years before the first homo sapiens (laughs) which is important now i guess we should be clear 800,000 is itself before homo sapiens but two plus million is before our homo ancestors. Yeah, this is going back just like before that's almost Yeah, I was gonna, it's almost older than the homo genus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whew. 
So it's pretty insane. So what the researchers did to get this number is they looked at prehistoric soil samples, paleosols, from the Luz Plateau in central China. These sediments date back uh, to two and a half million years, which is the beginning of the Pleistocene that we're looking at. Uh, and it's a collection of wind uh, driven dust. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're looking at. Uh, the oldest of the dust on the plateau goes back 22 million years. And what they're looking for in these soils are the carbonates preserved in the soil. The carbonates are formed when uh, carbon isotopes from both the atmospheric and ambient CO2 in the soil that's produced through soil respiration build up and leave their isotopic marker. You know, the way we study other radioactive isotopes. By looking at these carbonates in these soils, they were able to get an estimate for atmospheric carbon at the time that those soils were deposited. Cool. What they found is that in the Pleistocene, for most of the Pleistocene, there was an average of 230 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, which sounds like a big number, but it stayed at that number up until about 1965, <laughs> <laughs> at which point it jumped to 320 parts per million. Mm -hmm. And nowadays it is 410 parts per million. Yeah. So for the last 60 years, the carbon in the atmosphere has been higher than it has been for everything going back 2.5 million years before that. It's the entirety of what you might call the Ice Age. Yes. And in the time since the 60s, it's almost doubled. Yep. Yeah. And this lines up with the ice cores for the last 800,000 years. And even for the for the older uh, estimates from the early Pleistocene from Antarctic blue ice, so it seems that this is lining up with our previous estimates, but it just is pushing it much farther back than we realized. Right, right. Which means Homo sapiens evolved in a low carbon atmosphere. Yeah, and all of our ancestors, yes, like going back quite a ways, evolved in a low. Interesting. Yeah, it blew my mind when they nailed down. <laughs> 1965 yeah <laughs> well our records yeah more recently are very very precise but the fact that it <laughs> at no point before <laughs> that was the notable shift it was right there yep yeah that's really it's it's always interesting to learn about the ways in which our modern day world is starkly different from mm -hmm. the past and we talk about this a lot where it's like oh these this ecosystem today is not like anything in the past and, and this these conditions. Now, of course, the carbon dioxide levels are one of those things that is our doing. That yes. is something we have imposed upon the world. That is that is a direct effect. And I think that... Well, so what this basically... <laughs> it's what it sounds like this basically does is it uh, extends the length of the hockey stick. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So the famous hockey stick graph, popularized, I believe, by Michael Mann, is the graph of, I think it's temperature mm -hmm. data. That's what I remember seeing it as. And it is this sort of graph of ups and downs that follows a general straight line trend until you get to the last several decades and it swoops up at the end that shows our current trajectory of yeah. carbon dioxide and temperature rises. I like putting it into that evolutionary perspective of mm -hmm. like the entire ice age. Yes. Was at a level that is different from what we're seeing today. Interesting indeed. Yeah. yeah. And I'll be interested to see how this reads into. They were saying that this gives major implications for what we might see considering that our bodies weren't designed <laughs> for what we're actually experiencing yeah. right now it also means that all of the ecosystems and organisms that our ancestors lived alongside were not mm -hmm. evolved to be in this kind of environment yes so yeah hey maybe we'll go back to the pliocene <laughs> i mean that's where we're headed well speaking of the ice age and pleistocene stuff i am going to talk about some vertebrate fossils uh you broke our broke our street but it's not about, like, the discovery of vertebrate fossils. It's about trends in the fossil record. Okay. Stick with me. Back in 2017, there was this paper that came out that looked at the DNA of mammoths and determined the sex of, of a bunch of different mammoth, uh, almost 100 mammoth specimens from a variety of places and found the surprising result that about 70% of them were male. I believe this was also done, maybe it was part of the same study, with the mammoth site 
where they found where the fossil record of mammoths is showing an abundance of males more than females, which is odd because in a normal population, you'd expect one to one. Yep. Half and half, roughly. There were all sorts of discussions about what this might be. Maybe it's because you get these bachelor groups of males. Maybe it's because males, you know, a rogue male separated from the herd is more likely to get into trouble, is more likely to range more widely, and more likely to end up being preserved in the fossil record. Lots of interesting discussions about the mammoths. This study sought to see if other mammals show the same trends. This is research by Graham Gower et al. in PNAS, and we'll link to an article in Atlas Obscura by Sabrina Imbler. So in the study, they went and looked first at a bunch of late Pleistocene bison remains. Has to be very late Pleistocene because they're using DNA to determine the sex of the animals. You can determine sex from fossil remains uh, morphologically, but it's not always easy. DNA will do it. DNA, you know, especially with our fellow mammals, will give you an X or Y chromosome, and there you go. So they analyzed almost 200 specimens of late Pleistocene bison and found that around 75% of them were male. Huh. Interesting. Now, they point out that this could be explained the same way as the elephants, that you've got these rogue males separated from the herd, maybe they're getting into more trouble, they're ranging more widely, things like that. They also looked at bears. Arctic bear remains... Uh, again, sub what they call subfossils, so late Pleistocene uh, towards the modern, almost a hundred different brown bears, and they found around seventy-five percent of them were male, indicating that our fossil record has a bias hmm. towards males. With the bears, it's weird. Bears don't herd, so you don't get a rogue male effect or anything like that because all the bears are relatively isolated. What they did suggest is that maybe it's because males have wider territorial ranges. They're covering more space. Maybe they're more likely to be sampled by the fossil record. And to support this, they pointed out that the discrepancy between the sexes and the bears lessened as they got higher in latitude. And in modern bears, what we see is that the higher up, the farther north you go, the less food and resources there are. Females start expanding their ranges, too. So maybe it's a territorial thing. That, you know, it's it's how widely you're ranging. But in all cases, for, for three different species there, we're seeing a dramatic bias. That's a three to one or two to one, depending on, you know, which number. Bias towards males. Then they went a step further, and they looked at specimens in museum databases. Not fossil specimens, but modern collected specimens. You know, the last couple, you know, few centuries or so modern animals in museum databases. And they looked at the big, you know, the American Museum, the London Museum, the Smithsonian, the Royal Ontario Museum. They looked at a bunch of collections of mammal specimens and found that nearly every species they looked at was mostly males. So it's not just the fossil record. Modern collections are biased towards males. Which raises this incredible question of what the heck is going on? Why is it that males are being collected more often? It's a conspiracy. That must be it. <laughs> so it's a darn patriarchy again. <laughs> now, it could be, they point out, that even in modern specimens, ranging more widely or being more commonly off on your own makes you more likely to get either killed and then found or caught by a collector. Because a lot of these museum collectors are, you know, especially, you know, way in the past, going out and killing stuff mm -hmm. and then collecting it. They also made the point that in mammals, males tend to be bigger and cooler. And if you're a collector and you're going out to find the best specimen, you're more likely to shoot the big moose than the wimpy little one. Yeah, I mean, it's still in modern hunting rules. It's you hunt for the big, impressive male with the antlers or the horns or the what you have it. Yeah. That's really weird. Yeah. That's that's a weird bias with no straightforward answers. But it's also a, a, not a bias I would have put down to expect. Like, I expect a bias between young, adult, and old individuals. Because there's, you know, there's fewer of certain ones. There's fewer old individuals because most, you know, statistically... More of them have died by that point. But 
that's really odd, especially since it's with different behavioral groups like yeah. herding and predatory and, you know, animals that don't uh, uh, break up their populations the same way are still finding a same kind of percentage. Yeah, there's something you unified among male mammals that is making them more likely to be collected both by natural and human yeah. forces. Which is such an interesting thing to know. Hmm. Weird. Now, uh, notably, three species they found in the modern museum collections were female dominated. Ooh. Anteaters, which they could they didn't know how to explain. Sloths, which they didn't know how to explain, and bats. And bats, they suggested that it might be that whoever collected the bats collected them from most like a, a lot of your bats were coming from single roosts. And roosts tend to be female dominated. So maybe it's not that you caught, you know, you didn't catch a rogue bat that was out at the ends of its territory. You went into a cave and you collected a bunch of bats from where they were living and hanging out with their babies and stuff. So you're going to catch all the females. And it's, it's interesting. It's, it's notable. And I don't know what the note is, but I feel it should be <laughs> that like it is unusual mammals. Yeah. Like unique morphology mammals. Bats and sloths and anteaters. Weird. What I want to know is would you see the same thing if you looked at reptiles? That's exactly what I or was Or honestly, even better for DNA preservation and, and fossil record birds. Yes. I My next step, were I part of this research team, would be to see if we could do the same study with birds. Because that, I would love to know how widespread this is. If nothing else... This tells us that we have a bias in the fossil record that we're catching males for like mm -hmm. for whatever reason we are getting a skewed image of what mammals look like at least in the late Pleistocene. Which could mean if this expands to more fossil groups and other uh, eras that we're get our visual interpretation of certain species could just be the visual interpretation of the male. Yeah. I so yeah weird the male bias goes real deep i yeah it's got a long <laughs> history it's persistent jeez and that's the news for this episode which means it is time to move on to our feature presentation let's go back to a time when north america was covered in water and we had more beach a lot more beach <laughs> Take a trip back in time to the Mesozoic era, and you will find that it was during the Jurassic period and then into the Cretaceous period that the globe started to look very familiar. For a while before that, all of our continental landmasses, or most of them, were joined into the supercontinent Pangaea. But by the late Jurassic, the continents were all splitting up. So you were getting north and south splitting up and east and west splitting up. By the end of the Jurassic, the Atlantic Ocean existed. North and South America were off to one side. Europe, Asia, and Africa were off to the other side. It wasn't exactly like today. North and South America hadn't yet connected. Episode 43, Great American Biotic Interchange. India still hadn't made its way up to connect with the rest of Asia. Antarctica was making its way down to the South Pole. It wasn't covered in ice yet. But if you looked at a map, you would recognize North America. Which is why it's so cool that if you saw North America during the Cretaceous, what you would see is a North America split in half by the Western Interior Seaway. Today, if you travel across the country and you look for rocks of that age, you find land rocks on the east and west and a huge swath of ocean in the middle. Chalks and, 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 and sandstones and shales that tell you we had this ocean here which is really cool. It's one of the most famous features of prehistoric North America. The Western Interior Seaway, aka as the Cretaceous Seaway, the North American Inland Sea, or the Neobrarin Sea, covered a huge swath of North America. This was a seaway, a passage of ocean water, that started up in the Arctic Oceans and came across the continent down to the Gulf of Mexico. Cut it straight across. 
which also means that it was a meeting point across the continent for polar and tropical waters. It was what's known as an inland sea or an epiric sea. An epiric sea is what you get when you have basically a bunch of ocean water, right? A sea that is sitting over continental crust instead of oceanic crust. If you go to the Atlantic or the Pacific, what you're sitting over is oceanic crust, which tends to be much thinner and form these huge basins in which the oceans form. But when you have water flood a continent, you can get sort of deep ocean water over continental crust. The Baltic Sea in Northern Europe is an example of a modern one of these. Hudson Bay here in Northern, you know, up in Northern North America is another example of an inland sea. But no inland sea today is shaped like the Western Interior Seaway was. This was open on both sides of a continent. Like I said, mixed Northern and Southern waters. So it had a unique geology, a unique geography, unique ecosystems within it, and it had unique and intriguing effects on North America itself. Cool. Very exciting. And left a huge mark on the continent, right? If you look at Cretaceous sediments in North America, it's land to the west and land to the east and just tons of ocean in the middle. Like, Kansas is famous for ocean fossils. That's one of my favorite things to bring up at the museum is the weird places we find ocean fossils because of the weird places that the ocean has been in the past. Yep. And it, once you point that out, it makes obvious sense. But there's tons of times where they just, you know, uh, uh, things like trilobites and ammonites and fill in other famous ocean fossils, you know, crinoids. A lot of times those get just get treated as a, you know, filler fossil. Like, oh yeah, and then fossil was found. Put a picture of an ammonite. Right. Uh, but the reason it's there is because it was swimming above... <laughs> where you're standing at some point it was floating around in that area however many million years ago which is cool yeah and indeed you know where we live right now where we are sitting right now in east tennessee also has a bunch of ocean sediments but that is way earlier that's early paleozoic yes north america didn't look like north america yet the kansas ocean fossils are you know cretaceous north america was shaped like north america and to picture this dramatic shift in the geography is really cool. So where did it come from, I hear you ask? The formation of the Western Interior Seaway begins in the Jurassic. And the one of the biggest sort of factors that led to the creation of the seaway was mountain building. During the Jurassic and going into the Cretaceous, you had a bunch of intense mountain building episodes in Western North America. You had a Pacific Ocean crust subducting underneath the continent and also carrying chunks of land, you know, islands and, and parts that had broken off of other continents and sticking them onto the end of North America, which is a process called accretion. Mm -hmm. All of this tectonic activity causes uplift. It squeezes and pushes on the continent and create. This is how you get mountain ranges. In this case, this was the beginning of the most recent sort of major phase that led to the creation of the modern day Rocky Mountains. So today, you know, you go out, you see the big peaks. There were sort of the predecessors of the Rocky Mountains at this point, but this is when the modern day Rockies began to form. Uh, these are their baby steps. Yeah. One of the cool things that happens when you get a mountain range forming is that mountains are really, really heavy. And because they're heavy, they tend to weigh down the crust. So the area adjacent to a mountain range tends to be lower elevation than areas farther away. It's really easy to forget that physics still affects the surface of the planet. Yep. Like, you know, we tend to think that, well, the Earth creates gravity, so it's not, you know, incumbent to it. You know, it's not affected by... Well, no, it is. Like... Yeah. Earth is affected by its own gravity all the time. Yeah, like if you put something on your skin that has a little bit of weight to it, your skin's going to depress yeah, a little. dimple a little bit. And it's like sitting on a trampoline. You are weighing it down. Mountains do that. And so you get what's called a foreland basin, which is a basin, an area of low elevation, that runs alongside a mountain range. So heading into the Cretaceous period, the western interior 
of North America was being depressed, low elevation. Also at that time, in the early Cretaceous, we see a major rise in sea level. In fact, it is it is one of the highest points that we see the sea level hit in the last 500 million years or so. Wow. This was a time of big sea level rise. Rising sea levels can be caused by a number of different things. Usually warm temperatures are associated with higher sea levels. See also today. <laughs> and the two main reasons for that are that when it's warmer, ice melts. And if your ice caps are all, instead of being on land in the ocean, you have more water volume and warm water expands. Yeah. Another bit of physics yep. that it's easy to forget about is if you heat up the planet, hot things expand. Yeah. The water is taking up more space. Which is insane. But, and now this time period in the early Cretaceous, and indeed the whole of the Cretaceous, was warm. Compared to today, this was a very warm time. There were no ice caps. This was what's called a greenhouse world, where you did not have permanent ice anywhere on the planet in a major way, like you do today. But the sea level rise at this time is attributed, at least in part, to changes in the volume of the mid-ocean ridge system. So changes in the activity of your mid-ocean ridges, which are the undersea volcanic chains where new oceanic crust is being formed, can also impact your water levels because the activity down there is going to cause all sorts of water displacement. Dropping a marble into a cup is going to raise the surface of the water in the cup. Yeah. So all sorts of things were happening, leading to a rise of what's estimated at hundreds of meters of sea level. Wow. From what it was beforehand to when you get into the early Cretaceous. So what happens is you have this area of North America that is now a bit more depressed than usual. You have ocean that is higher level than usual. And as these two forces come together, North America becomes flooded. The most extensive flooding of North America over the last 300 million years or so. So what you had was a seaway. Once it formed, cutting across from north of Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico... To the east is what's called the Stable Cratonic Platform of North America, which is basically the foundation of the continent. Like, that's the core of the continent that's been there for billions of years <laughs> and isn't changing very much. And on the west side was this very active margin, this area where you had all mountain building and crustal deformation and volcanic activity because of all of that orogenic activity going on. The Western Interior Seaway came in different shapes and sizes over time because sea level, even though it was high, still went through rises and falls. What are called transgressions when the sea level rises and regressions when the sea level falls, which means the coastlines of the Western Interior Seaway shifted over time, exactly how expansive it was shifted over time. But at its peaks, it was very impressive <laughs> at the greatest extent of the western interior seaway it is estimated to have ranged around 5,000 kilometers north to south so around 3,000 miles so all of north america it spanned roughly 45 degrees of latitude wow at its widest extent it's it was about 2,000 kilometers across or 1,200 miles east to west to give you an idea of what that looks like, pull up your maps of North America now. <laughs> the western shoreline of the Western Interior Seaway, so what left beach fossils, beach remains across these states, would have run down through British Columbia up in Canada, through Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, and then down further into Mexico itself. The eastern shoreline cut through Ontario, Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, at times way western Tennessee, and then it curved around the Gulf Coast and created a shore that cut across Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia and up through the Carolinas. Oh, weird. So it wasn't just through the center. The Gulf Coast was farther inland than it is today. That's cool. And this meant that parts of the continent were, at times, entirely underwater including <laughs> Saskatchewan, Manitoba, both Dakotas, 
Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. Wow. Underwater. In their entirety or almost entirety. It's estimated that the at its maximum depth, the Western Interior Seaway was hundreds of meters deep. I've seen various estimates of 200 as high as 500 meters deep. So we're talking hundreds of meters, hundreds of feet of depth. It's not an ocean, Mm -mm. but that is plenty of space for having all sorts of cool ecosystems. It is, as I said, unlike any inland sea today. Whoa, I want one today. It sure be cool to see. That sounds awesome. (laughs) A lot of study has gone into trying to figure out what the sea was like. So things like temperature. Because it ranged from subtropical in the south to mid-temperate in the north, because this is a warmer time period. There's been a lot of discussion uh, geologically about how were the waters mixing. Mm -hmm. Like, was it cold water dominated from the north or warm water dominated from the south? It seems like it probably changed over time. Notably, at times, this seaway brought subtropical faunas as far north as Canada. (laughs) salinity has also been something that people have looked into a lot it's thought that it was usually fairly low salt content which notably meant that it would have a different group of organisms Mm -hmm. than you see in proper ocean more on that later and then circulation has gotten a whole lot of attention because you know it's rising it's falling it's carrying ocean water from north and south there's been a lot of discussion about what sort of the the how the waters were mixing and, and moving One note that I'll just want to make about that, I won't talk about it too much, is that it is suspected that during times of regression, falling sea level, it would have ended up with stratified ocean, so layers, distinct oceanic layers, leading to seafloor anoxia. Oh. That is, at the bottom of the sea, at times, you would have had very low oxygen or no oxygen conditions. Which is a real bad place to live, but a real good place to make fossils. Yeah. Anoxic conditions are great because it means no scavengers. It means very little in the way of decomposers and bacteria and stuff. So things become preserved really nicely. That's a big reason why we think so many things preserved at the gray fossil site. Yep. At the bottom of a very still, deep pond. And I even saw one study that was examining this sort of, you know, okay, how does, how how did all these effects come into play? How do you end up with anoxic oceans as a way of trying to understand what happens to oceanic oxygen in a warming world? Oh. We have things to learn from the Western Interior Seaway. That seems like it could be topical. Uh, Yeah, it seems like it might be important. (laughs) All in all, the deposits, all in all, this seaway left a ton of varied evidence across the continent. These days, we can look at the rocks across the interior of the continent and find not only deep water deposits, shallow water deposits, lots of shoreline and river deposits from the, the coasts of the sea, adjacent coal beds that formed slightly inland from the ocean that was cutting across the continent. There's this whole cool two shoreline setup across the middle of North America. The Western Interior Seaway has been extensively studied, like a lot of geologists cut their teeth sorting out the stratigraphy, the history, the layering of the Western Interior Seaway. Uh, Very famously, or infamously in some cases, (laughs) uh, it's better preserved on the West, The West Coast, we know way more about because it was a place of active sedimentation, right? Tectonics were in motion, and so you were getting rising mountains, eroding sediments, depositing new things. So we know a lot more about the West than the East. More on that later. (laughs) But even still, it left behind a lot of the great geologic features of North America. A lot of our most famous dinosaur sites are the coastlines of the Seaway. A lot of really good coal beds and even some of our national monument resources. Like Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument is, you know, sitting upon seaway deposits, which is really cool. Literally shaped this continent. Yes, it did. Lots of famous fossil site deposits, lots of famous fossil deposits like the Pier Shale, the Neobrara Formation, the Dakota Sandstone, lots of famous early North American paleontology centered around the western interior deposits and speaking of that 
This is a paleontology podcast. <laughs> We've been talking a whole lot about geology and geography, which is cool. Yeah. But certainly our listeners are now wondering, well, what lived in the Western Interior Seaway? Rocks. I'm glad. Yeah, right. that's all it was. It was rocks. <laughs> Moving on. Pet rocks. This is where they came from. The origins <laughs> of pet rocks. This is where rocks. they evolved. Yes, this is the evolutionary history of pet rocks. <laughs> At this time. The early Cretaceous, and especially into the late Cretaceous, when the, the seaway was at its greatest extent, North America was mid to high latitudes, tropical in the south, temperate in the north. Most of this time period, you didn't have freezing temperatures in the continents, so you've got, you know, your plants and, and various biomes living without freezing. Very rich, very diverse time on land and in the water. The Western Interior Seaway is, of course, home to lots and lots of invertebrates. Yeah. Things we've talked about before, like ammonites and belemnites, go back to episode 16. Ooh. All those coil-shelled and straight-shelled squid relatives. Crustaceans and crinoids, so the sea lilies, mm -hmm. including stalkless sea lilies. There's a genus called Uintacrinus. Well, stalkless sea lilies, which is pretty cool. That's neat. Famously, there were also enoceramid clams. These were clams that could grow up to five or six feet across. <laughs> that wasn't the dimension I thought you were about to say. <laughs> <laughs> five or six <laughs> inches? Yeah. Feet. That's a two meter clam. Wow. And the book that I have, Oceans of Kansas by Mike Everhart, I think this is where I read this, described that in some places it would have been just a floor of giant clams. Yeah. Just all over the place. And then on top of the clams were barnacles and smaller oysters and things. That's cool. Yes, a really cool diversity of invertebrates. But notably, do perhaps be to the low salinity, right, low salt content of the seaway, we tend not to find things like bryozoans, the moss animals, so quote, quote, moss animals, which are very common in the fossil record, echinoids, which includes things like sea urchins, and coral. Interesting. Not a lot of coral in the Western Interior Seaway, which is odd because it's a shallow, warm sea. You would expect tons of coral. Yeah, it, it's. <laughs> I expect the Western Interior Seaway was confused. It's, I set up everything so nicely for yeah, you. Why aren't you coming here? It's shallow. It's warm. There's <laughs> lots of coastline. I don't understand. <laughs> why is my aquarium dying? <laughs> but yeah, and, and that's really it's a it's a good stark difference between this was not quite acting like an ocean mm -hmm. because it was it had unique conditions that were not matching what we saw in the ocean so you weren't getting certain familiar things like coral as to why it had such a low salt content i read some stuff about this i didn't go into too much depth about it i believe it had something to do with where the water is being pulled from and also how precipitation and it runoff yeah balances with evaporation rates not acting like an ocean. It's not yeah. surrounded by the same things an ocean would be. So it's it's this weird environment. Also, of course, a lot of this salinity and temperature information comes from the other organisms in the the, the seaway. Algae, plankton, you know, all sorts of plankton-y plankton things. Algae and forams and radiolarians and all those microscopic organisms that are super handy for studying conditions in ancient seas. Also, the seaway is full of plants. Lots of leaf impressions come from the margins of the seaway. And even there are some really famous discoveries of just tree trunks. Oh, cool. Logs that got washed out to sea and then buried in the anoxic sediments down below. And then you got a log. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so when you, if you're surrounded by continent, you end up with a lot of continental stuff. So there was a log in the hole in the bottom of the sea. Yeah, indeed there was. At least in the Cretaceous. Cool. Um, as to whether there was a frog, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> I don't think there are any frogs from the Western Interior Seaway. <laughs> Although there might be. That's how low salinity is this getting. <laughs> it's just a giant stream. <laughs> like before, though, you'll notice we haven't even talked about vertebrates yet. So let's spend the entire rest of the episode talking about vertebrates. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with fish, as is to be expected. Yeah, all sorts of fish in the Interior Seaway. Fish of all different sizes including a couple of famous ones, like Xyphactinus. Woo! If you've heard of any Cretaceous fish, you may have, you've probably heard of Xyphactinus. This was a big fish. This is a five meter long, 
You know, this is a fish the size of a great white shark. Yeah. Big ol' fish. Just gnarly looking, too. And they, yeah, with all the teeth. And they they have yeah. that, that really great fish scowl mouth where it's like yeah. a hinge trap door bottom jaw thing. And yeah, yeah. They're, they're awesome. It looks mean. Also, fish like Encodus, which is the famous, quote, saber-toothed salmon. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool yeah relative of modern salmon with these long sort of fangs in its mouth of course there were also lots of sharks very famously sharks including the what's called the ginsu shark yes uh Kratoxy rhino and it's named after the shape of its teeth and it is thought to have been an abundant predator in the western interior seaway also squally corax which is a famous shark and also the one that is depicted in the teaser image that we posted online, teasing this episode. And then a, a shark called Tychotis, the crusher shark, which had these globular teeth that mm. it was using to crush up mollusks and stuff, which were abundant in the interior seaway. Sharks were a major component of this ecosystem across the western interior seaway. Lots of bones and things found in the seaway have bite marks on them. And indeed, the Everhart book makes the delightful comment that Kansas is a great place to find shark teeth <laughs> because of the seaway. That's cool. Yeah, I, I remember the first time way back starting my starting in the master's program and going to, I think, my first SVP when they were handing out reprints and stuff. Uh, with this table's full of, you know, full of them. And I saw one that was, uh, you know, dinosaur bone with shark tooth impression, you know, shark tooth markings, gougings on it you know and i saw that and was like that's the craziest coolest thing i've ever read <laughs> and then within that svp saw like three or four more and then since then have realized that's actually a fairly common thing to find yeah is fossils of ancient animals that at one point were chewed on by a shark yes and i love it As the sh- they're everywhere yeah and they'll bite that's how they say hello <laughs> yes <laughs> it's, to bite stuff it's i have a mouth and a body. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so sharks, very common across the, the seaway. I believe that there are also a, a, a number of discoveries of stomach contents in sharks from the seaway, which is also really exciting to find. So we have a good picture of that sort of fish ecosystem. Also in there are a bunch of marine reptiles, Woo! including some really famous entries, uh, sea turtles. Yay! Are found from the Western Interior Seaway, including giant sea turtles. And I don't just mean like big sea turtles, I mean the biggest sea turtles. Yeah. Archelon. Woo! And Protostega, which are four to five meter long sea turtles. <laughs> the biggest sea turtles that ever lived. Archelon is the famous one. Yes. Like if, you, if you've seen a picture of an ancient sea turtle, especially if it's huge, it's Archelon. That was the one I always use as my go-to when I worked at the aquarium. Yep. Of, Here's our sea turtle. They used to get this big. Yeah. Found here in the Western Interior Seaway. Yes. Also, all your other favorite marine reptiles. There are ichthyosaurs from the Western Interior. Plesiosaurs. So those are the ichthyosaurs are the, the dolphin-shaped ones. Plesiosaurs are the long-necked paddle-flippered ones. And pliosaurs, which are plesiosaurs with short necks, like yep. uh, Liopleurodon mm-hmm. and Chronosaurus, at various times found in the Western Interior. And the best thing that's found in the Western Interior Seaway, Mosasaurs. <laughs> Back in episode 51, we mentioned a bunch of famous Mosasaurs. So these are the whale lizards. Yeah. A lot of the famous names we mentioned were found in the Western Interior Seaway. So the three big famous North American ones, Clydastes, Platycarpus, and the enormous Tylosaurus, are Western Interior discoveries. Also, Globodens, the crushing-toothed one. Oh, cool. Is found in the Western Interior Seaway. Neat. Hanging out with our crushing-toothed shark. And eating, you know, ceramid clams, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> like Lady in the Tramp. Just, yeah, starting on either side of a six-foot clam. Just, just a extremely noisy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so a, a diverse, varied oceanic ecosystem. Your ichthyosaurs would have been earlier in the Cretaceous. Mosasaurs took over later in the Cretaceous. The sea level's rising and falling, and you've got all these different cool ocean animals. But some of the most famous 
animal fossils in the interior seaway are land animals. Yeah. There's a lot of dinosaurs in the seaway. Now, I know what you're saying, but wait a minute. You've said repeatedly that there were no aquatic dinosaurs. That's pretty much true. I didn't swim there. <laughs> if your sea is on the, the you know, just like those logs get washed yeah. out to sea. Yeah, so do dinosaurs. There are a lot of ankylosaurs, which we discussed in episode 69, have a habit of getting in the water and flipping over and be, a, being fossilized upside down. <laughs> uh, so notosaurs specifically are pretty common from both the shoreline and deeper waters. Weird. Also hadrosaurs. Oh. The duck bills, quote unquote, duck bill dinosaurs, which is what is depicted in the teaser image that we posted online is a couple of sharks looking at this carcass of a hadrosaur that has been washed out to sea. So we learn a lot about sort of, you know, on the western side of the seaway, we get dinosaurs washing in from the western side of the continent and this opposite on the eastern side. Included among the dinosaurs in the interior seaway are birds. Which makes sense. Ichthyornis, very famously, was a probably shore bird, so that makes a lot of sense. And Hesperornis, which was a water-dwelling bird. That is the famous diving birds of the Cretaceous, were the Hesperornithids. You might recall us discussing in episode 37, and briefly in episode 58, that those two birds, Ichthyornis and Hesperornis, were among the most important discoveries of Othniel Charles Marsh, famous early paleontologist in North America. Those were the first discoveries of toothed birds. Yeah. And a huge clue for learning about the evolution of birds, their evolutionary ancestry. Those discoveries came from the Western Interior Seaway. Thank you, Western Interior Seaway. The discovery that made Darwin write to Marsh to compliment him on his discoveries about bird evolution came from this ocean, <laughs> which is really cool. The birds, uh, you know, obviously some of them are getting in there. Hesperornis lived in the water yes. for in large part. But Ichthyornis and other birds would have been flying over the ocean. They could have gotten washed in, but also if you're flying over the ocean and you die for whatever reason or you fall in, now you can become fossilized. Yeah. Which also explains why there are hundreds and hundreds of fossilized pterosaurs. Yeah. In the Western Interior Seaway. Once the, so pterosaurs are the famous flying reptiles of the Mesozoic. Pteranodon was discovered from the Western Interior Seaway. That's a big name. That's a big name. It's about as big <laughs> outside of Pterodactylus. Yes. It's about as big as the names get. In fact, I, I found a reference to a survey from the 80s of the Smoky Hill Chalk, which is a formation that preserves interior seaway sediments, that found that about 12% of the surveyed fossil remains were pterosaurs. Wow! Which is a, and like twice that much as mosasaurs and twice that much as fish. That's wow. a lot of pterosaurs! They were just covering the sky above the the seaway. So when you see artist reconstructions of pterosaurs flying over the ocean, this is a large part of where that comes from, is they were. They were taking these trips out over the western interior seaway, either migrating or looking for food. And yeah, every now and then you'd lose one and it mm -hmm. would sink down to the anoxic depths and end up preserved. We've learned a ton about pterosaurs from these waters. Which is hugely important because... As we've mentioned in, I, I know a couple of newses that covered pterosaurs, they're really fragile. Yeah. And typically don't fossilize well. Nope. So having a place that fossilizes them well <laughs> is awesome. Having a pterosaur catcher. Yes, that, that's what I keep thinking of the seaway as, is it's just like this big fossil net <laughs> running through the middle of the continent that's just catching things from the sides and swimming through the middle and flying over the top. It's also immediately puts into my mind just replacing like documentary footage of albatrosses with pterosaurs as they just glide across the waves and oh yeah are just traveling for you know who i mean especially for the bigger pterosaurs they could be on the wing for probably days just out oh, over yeah. the water some of them could have made it from coast to coast yeah which is Absolutely. so cool <laughs> and i think that's something that's also notable about having a seaway like this is number one animals don't often as quite as often fly over the ocean not far out over the ocean and also if they fall in there the odds of them becoming preserved and fossilized for the future are not particularly high but if it's continental area that will by the end of the cretaceous 
be land again, then you have a really good chance of getting that preserved. The mm-hmm. seaway preserved things in ways that other environments simply don't. And indeed, like I said, it was a crucible for early North American paleontology. We talked about a bunch, you know, in episode 58, especially with the Bone Wars. In episode 56, we talked about the evolution of evolutionary theory. A lot of that early paleo work in North America came from here. Cope and Marsh and Lighty and Sternberg and Mudge, a lot of them sort of, uh, uh, oh man, sunk their teeth in, got their start. There's a phrase that I can't think of. I, I, I You know what I'm trying to I say. I know where you're going, but I, I can't think of it either. <laughs> In Western Interior Seaway sediments, or the the sediments on either side, right, the shorelines of the Western Interior Seaway where dinosaurs were walking around, this is historically and prehistorically a really important geographical feature. I like it because not only does this preserve cool fossils, but it preserves a unique collection. You know, it's not just an area that happened to collect really good examples of what was living around but it was a unique collection of animals and plants and organisms and it that's because it was a unique environment that we really haven't seen much of for such an expansive intercontinental seaway which just uh, it's it's cool and important and unique on all fronts which is it's hard not to just kind of fall in love with the western interior seaway paleontologically yeah, and, and and it's famous for those reasons. Mm-hmm. And it, it has just left this indelible mark on North America. And in fact, I'll take this opportunity to make a comment about my favorite relic of the Western Interior Seaway. I, may, I don't remember if I've mentioned this on the podcast before. I've definitely mentioned it to you, Will. Yeah. I read an article years ago that was explaining how the Western Interior Seaway impacts modern-day United States politics. <laughs> I told you about this? I remember hearing about it, but I don't remember the, spef- the specifics. If you bring up a map of the United States, of the counties in the United States, by how they vote. So look up a map of, you know, election wins, especially if a Republican wins. So mm-hmm. look up when Trump won, look up when Bush won, and what you'll see is in the southeastern United States, it's a whole bunch of red, and then there's this line of blue, (laughs) which means, so the red counties are voting Republican, and the blue counties are voting more Democrat. And there's this blue belt that cuts across like Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and that line of Democratic voting counties matches up with the southern shoreline <laughs> of the western interior seaway which at, uh, and the gulf coast cut across the middle of those states and the reason is that as this article explained it and i haven't found anything telling me that this is wrong so i'm going to repeat it here and i'll link it in the in the blog post yes. so people can check it out the sediments deposited along that coastline led to very rich fertile soils that were perfect for growing things like cotton. Uh, so you ended up back in, you know, centuries ago with what was known as the Black Belt, which was originally uh, supposedly used to refer to the soil. Yeah, the, the, this the, dark, rich soil. But then, of course, also doubled as a way to refer to the fact that those counties where you had all your cotton plantations ended up getting lots and lots of African-Americans who at the time, of course, were being used for as slaves Yes, to work in those fields. Well, later on, when emancipation came along and now all the humans in North America are being treated much more like humans, a lot of the, the African-Americans living there didn't move away. They stuck around. Yes, absolutely. And so you ended up with this bunch of counties with unusually high African-American populations And still to this day, they are there, and demographically, African Americans in the U.S. tend to vote Democrat more than they vote Republican. Yeah. So the Western Interior Seaway shoreline impacts who's voting what in Southern states. Still affecting us today. (laughs) Which is so cool! It's fantastic. what was the shoreline became the Black Belt, became the Blue Belt, became influential in modern elections. How cool is that? It's wonderful. Like it's, I love just that this thing 
shaped so much, both literally physically shaped and just the ecosystem, both past and present, yeah, of North America. And it it's it's well known among us who dabble in the past, uh, but I don't hear it mentioned nearly often enough in just intro, you know, dinosaur books. Like I wish a lot more of my kid dinosaur books talked about the fact that the middle yeah of north america was underwater while some of the most famous dinosaurs were walking around parents out there do your kids dinosaurs books mention this yeah let us know i'd be curious to know how common it is because i didn't it's saying in my books either i learned about it definitely if not grad school late college was when i actually learned what it was called and what that yeah, you know yeah. what that entailed yeah yeah well, the other really fascinating thing that the Western Interior Seaway did was it split the continent in two. Yes. So after the break, we will discuss the two opposing continental landmasses of Laramidia and Appalachia. Cool. The most extensively studied land animals in the Cretaceous of North America are, go ahead everybody, right, dinosaurs. Uh, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's the reason they're famous. If you look at Jurassic dinosaurs in North America, and indeed early Cretaceous dinosaurs, what you see is that the East and the West, all across the continent, look very similar. They are what you might call homogenous. It's similar species, similar groups living across the continent. However, as the Western Interior Seaway inundates, creeps its way across, creeps across, and ultimately splits the continent, as the Cretaceous wears on, you start to see these stark differences. Just like the crocodiles on New Guinea, just like we talked about in episode four about island evolution, when you separate out different groups of organisms, they start to diverge evolutionarily from each other. The east and west sides of North America did the same thing. So let's take a zoom in. We're gonna, we're, we've are gonna we been zoomed in on the, the seaway. We're going to shift to the west and talk about Laramidia. Laramidia was a continent? Subcontinent? Yeah. It's sort of... It's weird because it's all still North America. It's not actually split. It's just covered by stuff. Yeah. It, yeah, from space, it looks like they've split up. Yes. But geologically, all of it's still there. So this is just like the... It's just poking its two little crocodile eyes up yes. <laughs> out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> the western section was known as Laramidia. Laramidia was long and slender because the seaway was sh more towards the west. So you had this narrow band of land that, you know, includes western Canada down through Washington, Oregon, California, down into Mexico. On the eastern side, on the shores of the Western Interior Seaway, was you know, Utah, New Mexico. Laramidia made up only about 20% of the current area of North America. So it was a narrow section. Laramidia experienced an enormous radiation of dinosaurs during the Cretaceous. There is lots of dinosaur diversity, and this is thought in part to be due to the fact that this landmass was very variable. There was mountain building going on, which means you're getting all sorts of changes to the landscape. It means you're seeing all sorts of climatic differences, right? It's narrow north to south, and so you've got a lot of sort of vertical latitudinal differences. As the sea level's rising and falling, you're getting different uh, uh, ecosystems. There's been argument over whether or not there were ecological provinces, which is to say that, like, this area you would find these organisms, and this area you'd find these organisms. There may have been some of that going on. Regardless, lots and lots of dinosaurs, including a bunch of the most famous dinosaurs in North America. Now, the Jurassic is where you have, you know, Stegosaurus and, and Apatosaurus and all those, but in the Cretaceous, all the, if you name a Cretaceous dinosaur, uh, now odds are name a Cretaceous dinosaur is from North America anyway, because that's where the famous <laughs> stuff is. But like name a North American Cretaceous dinosaur, you're looking at Laramidia. Laramidia included all sorts of theropods, the the carnivores. Uh, well, 
things like ornithomimids, which yeah. are omnivorous, uh, uh, perhaps also Deinonychus and similar Dromaeosaurs, and of course Tyrannosaurids, Woo! the family Tyrannosauridae. Like all the famous Tyrannosaurids are here: Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus and T. Rex itself at the very late latest Cretaceous. There were also lots of hadrosaurs, like Parasaurolophus and Lambiosaurus, the sort of famous big crested, head crest dinosaurs. Pachycephalosaurs, so Pachycephalosaurus, and its maybe relatives, <laughs> uh, Stiggy Moloch and Draco Rex. Oh yeah, it's cousins, like it's... literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> First and second cousins. Uh, Ankylosaurs, so Ankylosaurus is from here, and then a lot of its armored uh, brethren. Laramidia is also thought to be the sort of diversification center, perhaps even the origination of ceratopsids. Oh, wow. So the derived ceratopsians, which is to say there was this whole group of dinosaurs, episode 21 we talked about it, with these head crests. The ceratopsids were the big four-legged, big frills, big horns, Triceratops, Centrosaurus, Chasmosaurus, Pentaceratops, Utahceratops, Cosmoceratops. North America is loaded with members of the Ceratopsidae. And indeed, Laramidia appears to be the home base of Ceratopsidae. That's a that's a big get, Laramidia. Yeah, and then they, from here, eventually are thought to have spread over to Asia. So this is, you know, that like famous Triceratops T-Rex kind of battle. Yeah. That's Laramidia. Like, that is he, he, this part of the continent. A ton of famous dinosaur discoveries. All these things. Famous specimens like Sue, the famous T-Rex. In fact, all famous T-Rexes. <laughs> Laramidia. Uh, Leo, the, the mummified Brachylophosaurus. That's Laramidia. Um, the formations that, that you find here, you go up north to Alberta, the Dinosaur Park Formation. All of the, the finds up in Drumheller and such. That's Laramidian dinosaurs. Farther down south, as I mentioned before, Grand Staircase Escalante. Uh, and then even th further down south, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. That's the, the national area that was in a, the news a while back because politicians were trying to shrink it and paleontologists were fighting back. Because mm -hmm. that's an enormous source of Laramidia information from this time period. And then, of course... One of the most famous fossil sites in the world, the Hell Creek Formation. Well, I say fossil sites. It is many, many, many fossil sites across multiple states. Hell Creek is your T-Rex, Triceratops, Dakota Raptor. It's the ecosystem uh, uh, reconstructed in Saurian, yeah. the video game. And it was this vast sort of floodplain area where you had all this drain, all these rivers and streams and stuff because you were on the shoreline of the western interior seaway if t-rex walked east eventually it would run into mosasaurus <laughs> of the western interior seaway fight 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 yeah right well <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. let them fight <laughs> <laughs> so the laramidian con we know a ton about it we have a bunch of different dinosaurs it is the better preserved of the two and so a lot of our picture of cretaceous north america comes from laramidia and this is what Part of why I was mentioning that I feel like the seaway doesn't get mentioned often enough, because at least to me, when th books and documentaries talk about those animals, they often make it seem like they're roaming across North America, that they are just, because you know, it's just said that they are North American animals. Right. Okay, well, you're half right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally. And that's that's an important distinction to make, that you did not have a lot of these famous dinosaurs roaming over here on the East Coast where we're sitting right now. Right. And that's a big difference. <laughs> there were some. The early Cretaceous, you had much more mixing. Mm -hmm. And then at the latest Cretaceous, you get some more mixing. More on that later. <laughs> the other side of the continent, the eastern chunk, Appalachia, or Appalachia, if you're a person that lives around where we are sitting mm -hmm. right now. The kind of people that would be mad at me for saying yes. Appalachia. Yes. Sorry. I, I grew up here and I say Appalachia, so I'm sticking with it. <laughs> the Appalachian subcontinent eh, is much more poorly understood because, like we said before, the eastern chunk of the continent is much more stable. 
it's not changing as much, which means there's not as much sedimentation from new mountains being formed. Also, a lot of the rock in this area, especially in the mountainous regions, is more ancient rock. And the Cretaceous Age stuff has been weathered away on top of it if it was deposited in the first place. Which makes the eastern section of the, the split North America much more mysterious, and thus I have more to say about it. Because <laughs> there's more questions in yeah. this. Appalachia was wide, right? So much wider, more rectangular shaped rather than the, the slender shape of Laramidia. It's the eastern coast, so the, the seaway is cutting across Missouri and, and Arkansas and those states. The Gulf Coast is much higher, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, as I said before, and poorly sampled. Not a lot of good terrestrial Cretaceous fossil sites in Appalachia, which also means that we don't really get articulated remain, which is to say sort of skeletons that are still complete, still... Yeah, full body. Full body, the, the bones are roughly where they're supposed to be. When we're looking at Appalachian dinosaur remains, it, we're mostly getting fragments, we're getting bits and pieces. Chunks of them. Even other animals, too. You know, it's it's just not as good a sample. You can see that if you go to uh, ap uh, uh, museums in the states that made up Appalachia. Yes. Is that a lot of times their <laughs> dinosaur hall are chunks of bone behind glass. Right. And, you know, they may have a replica of the skeleton that would go with that dinosaur, but they don't actually have all of those fossils that being said we do have remains of dinosaurs and enough to get a pretty good sense of what kind of dinosaur ecosystems we had here on the eastern side of the continent and what's really notable is what appalachia was missing <laughs> a lot of the famous stuff that i mentioned over in laramidia appalachia did not does not appear to have had ceratopsids Triceratops and friends, for the most part, did not make it over to Appalachia. We did not have pachycephalosaurs. We did not have ankylosaurids, for the most part. Tyrannosaurids. We had cousins of some of these uh, of yeah. these groups. But like Tyrannosauridae, T-Rex, Gorgosaurus, that core family, was not over here on the eastern side. So instead, what we saw in Appalachia was a lot of what I've seen called relict groups, members of earlier sort of branches of these groups, more basal groups. So whereas over in Laramidia, the ancestors gave rise to unique new groups, the ty Tyrannosaurids, the Ceratopsids, in Appalachia, instead you had diversification of those earlier forms. So what you're saying is that Appalachia is playing with base Skyrim, and Laramidia has mods. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The modded T-Rex was broken. <laughs> <laughs> All the Appalachians are like, listen, why did you need to do that? Yeah, no, it, it was, was fun. fine. <laughs> it's fine and a fun game. Probably the most common herbivores on the Appalachian subcontinent were hadrosauroids. Not your Parasaurolophus, Lambiosaur sort of duckbills, but the more basal groups, sort of. Uh, hadrosaur cousins yeah right still within the broader group but not those specific groups that you saw over in the west so things like hadrosaurus these were very common in su in like the southern parts of appalachia these represent about half the known dinosaurs <laughs> wow and if you are uh, picturing ecosystems where you don't have a lot of the horned dinosaurs the armored dinosaurs the pachycephalosaurs well there's only so many herbivorous dinosaur groups these now have all of this space to roam. Early cousins of the Triceratops group, the Leptoceratopsians, are known from Appalachia. There are Nodosaurs, so the clubless Ankylosaurs in Appalachia. All right, I'll take that. Yeah, that's not too bad. The yeah. Leptosaur Leptoceratopsians are largely bipedal, yeah, frilled dinosaurs. They're they're like uh, if you can picture Protoceratops, the famous little frilled but hornless mm -hmm. that but standing up yeah. with its little front limbs picked up also we had basal dromaeosaurs so cousins of your deinonychus your your dakota raptor things like sornitholestes and we did not have over here in the east tyrannosaurids but we did have tyrannosauroids <laughs> a lot of oids over a lot here. of oids a lot of oids uh driptosaurus over in new jersey 
and very famously from Arkansas, Appalachiosaurus, <laughs> which was a big dinosaur. So Appalachia was not devoid of large theropods, but just not the same group and indeed not the same diversity which means as that, over in Laramidia. Which means that at a at a snapshot glance, if you were to take a really quick tourist, you know, uh, uh, train ride through the two subcontinents, they the ecosystems would look very similar with big predators, little predators, big herbivores, little herbivores. But you'd be missing a lot of the diversity that showed up in Laramidia and the big famous names, the Hollywood right. <laughs> dinosaurs <laughs> are really only sectioned into that slender piece of land. Yeah, all the dinosaur movies take place in Laramidia. Yeah. And leave out Appalachia. Even though some really famous fossil sites are over in Appalachia. Most notably things like the Hadrosaurus Quarry in Haddonfield, New Jersey, which we talked about that... that may have been the site that kicked off the Bone Wars. <laughs> and indeed, Hadrosaurus fulci, the first dinosaur discovered in North America, here in Appalachia. Appalachiosaurus comes from, oh, I said Arkansas before, Alabama. Uh, I apologize. The Demopolis Chalk in Alabama. Arkansas, I was thinking Arkansas because that Arkansas dinosaur I mentioned oh, yeah. before is an Arkansas dinosaur oh, that from is... over here on the Appalachian side. That's pretty cool. Alabama Appalachiosaurus. There's the Arundel Clay in Maryland. There's the Tar Heel Formation in North Carolina, which is famous for Leptoceratops remains, or Leptoceratopsians at least. So there are cool fossil sites, just the sample isn't as good, which means it's difficult to assess what exactly the ecosystems were like. Were there truly fewer dinosaurs over here, or is it just that the fossil record over here is not as good? I've seen some references that seem to think that yeah even though the the fossils aren't very good we have enough that we are looking at a decent sample of what was here yeah and if that's the case comparing across the two we can see that there is a there are these distinctions between what kinds of dinosaurs were living in different places and how they were arranged so there does appear to be it seems some possible provincialism Different sections of Appalachia had their own unique ecological characters. So the Gulf Coast Plain would have been different from the Atlantic Coast Plain and different from the western section of the continent, different from the Canadian section of the continent. Hadrosaurs appear to have been more diverse than in Laramidia. Even though they had derived hadrosaurs, they also had all those other herbivores. Appalachia was all hadrosaurs all the time, except for things like notosaurs. There were consistently hadrosaurs occupying multiple size classes. Oh, cool. So you saw hadrosaurs of three different sizes in many different places, ranging up to things like hadrosaurus, which were huge. You know, really you know, T-Rex sized and bigger hadrosaurs. That's cool. They did. They were doing the horse thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's neat. <laughs> the tyrannosauroids, also a, probably the apex predators in Appalachia, similar to what they would have been over in Laramidia, but notably, and here's an interesting thing, in general, Appalachia seems to have been less dinosaur diverse than Laramidia, and with theropods specifically, the big meat eaters, northern Appalachia was more diverse than southern Appalachia. Huh. There are a handful of different big theropods known from the northern section of the continent, but Appalachiosaurus is really the only large dinosaur, the large predatory dinosaur known from the southern section of Appalachia, which might be taphonomic, mm -hmm. which is to say the fossil record is biased and we're just not getting a lot. They're probably all male. But we're just not <laughs> seeing a lot of what was there. But if it's legitimate, that raises the question of what was going on in southern Appalachia that you didn't have this as many large predators. And I came across an interesting postulation, Will, that you will very much enjoy. Oh, boy. Because all across the Gulf Coastal Plain at this time, there was this other animal called Dinosuchus. Yep, that's where it's from. You want to uh, remind the audience what Dinosuchus is? <laughs> Dinosuchus, much like we were talking about all the famous dinosaur mo movies taking place in Laramidia, basically any time you've ever seen a picture of a giant croc with a dinosaur. It's been a picture of Dinosuchus. This was a upwards of, for the largest species and specimens, 40 foot long 
actually more closely related to alligators than crocs, but crocodilian cousin that was found around the coastal regions of that area. They were actually fairly close to the the seaway, often found in salty environments, which is interesting because they don't seem to have salt glands. But massive six-foot-long, two-meter skulls. Yeah. (laughs) Six-foot-long skulls. Skulls. The head (laughs) I could have laid on top of the skull without my feet hanging off the end. Yep. They are known... Uh, to have been all across the Gulf Coast Plain and even further north. Bite marks have been found on dinosaur bones, suggesting these animals all across, especially in southern Appalachia. They seem to have been very popular down there. Cool. And they weren't the only ones. There was Delta Sucus, another large crocodilian, also common, also seems to have been eating dinosaurs, and then, you know, whatever else it could get. Yep. So it has been suggested that maybe the reason that there there were fewer large theropods in southern Appalachia is because the Gulf Coastal Plain was the do- domain of giant crocs. Which is so cool. Which does make Appalachia real cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, sure, you, T-Rex, whatever. Yeah, giant crocs. And then this was, this is... A croc built to take down big stuff. Like, Nile crocs are are evolved to take down zebras and wildebeest. Yeah. This was a tough, like, giant-toothed croc cousin. Which is a cool thing to think about that, yeah, if you're gonna, like, quadruple your beachfront area, <laughs> you're gonna quadruple your shoreline predators. Yeah. <laughs> like, of course a continent covered in beaches would have shoreline predators. It's the closest thing I have <laughs> to a silver lining for what we might have looking forward in our current future. <laughs> yeah. It's nice subtropical continent covered in o- ocean. <laughs> yeah. Just lots yeah, of crocs. Crocs everywhere. <laughs> The Western Interior Seaway did not survive much past the Mesozoic. At the end of the Cretaceous, uh, by the end of the Cretaceous, continued uplift, so continued mountain building, uh, a shift in the pattern of mountain building, led to the center of the continent to start to uplift, and the sea level recessed, went through a regression. So sea level dropped, land continued to rise, and gradually you do see the closing of the Western Interior Seaway, the 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 de-flooding, the, yeah, the draining, the of draining it. of this continent. This caused a relatively short period of severe environmental rearranging, <laughs> which is really cool to think about. That you had these like continuous peat forming environments, these coal forming environments up and down the shorelines that are now breaking up. You had places that would have been draining of water. You had places where the, the shoreline is moving and your ecosystems, your what kind of habitats you have are rearranging. I found one paper that talks extensively about what they call the Dakota Isthmus. Cool. Which would have existed when the Dakotas, right, North and South Dakota, were a land br- a bridge is a weird thing to say, but a land passage as the sea drained to the north and south. So you would have been able to cross through the Dakotas, which would have been this network of lagoons and bayous and estuaries, this like recently drained environment as the sea is pulling away from it, which would have formed all sorts of cool, unique ecosystems completely unlike what we have today. That's so awesome. And of course, at the late, right at the end, the Maastrichtian, right? The latest Cretaceous, we do start to see evidence of dinosaurs immigrating across the two continents. We start to see Laramidian dinosaurs showing up over in Appalachia. And so they used to be very similar. They became isolated and different. And then they start to homogenize again. And then the end Cretaceous happens and they all go away. (laughs) So who knows what would have happened? It could have been cool. When your ceratopsids start invading what was hadrosaur country and T-Rex comes over and sees giant hadrosaurs and goes, oh, look at this. Finally, a meal the size for me. (laughs) Uh, Although I'm pretty sure it had it. (laughs) Plenty of hadrosaurs to eat. (laughs) These have far less horns. Yeah, (laughs) fewer crests, all sorts of stuff. And so the saga of the Western Interior Seaway comes to a close as the Mesozoic does, leaving behind all of these cool sediments for us to find. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome little period and and feature 
right there at the end of the Mesozoic. What a cool chapter in our continent's history. Yeah. Well, hopefully we've d- bestowed upon you a great appreciation for the Western Interior Seaway, for the lost land of mosasaurs and giant alligator relatives that lived here in humble North America. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I believe we have a patron question. We do. Oh, goody. Do you want to do the honors? So we have our Patreon we mentioned earlier, and at certain levels, our patrons can ask us questions that we answer here on the podcast. Right here, live on the podcast. Live for us. Today's question is from Cheryl, who asks if we can explain more about the role of the null hypothesis in the scientific method. How does it work? Does the researcher who is doing the work always apply it, or is it often other researchers who may want to challenge the findings and are actively searching for an opposite evidence? Now, we discussed this back in episode 20. Yeah, when we way talked back. about the scientific method, which, fun fact, was the last episode that we did that wasn't listener requested. True. That yeah. was the topic we chose because it had sort of come up in questions and in our interactions with people. And we thought, hey, this would be a cool one to mm-hmm. do. That was the last time we ever did a non-listener requested episode. Yeah, cool yeah. stuff. But this is a request to talk more about. It is. And it's a good question. And it's a question that I feel a lot of people who have been through intro statistics or intro research classes and uh, 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 courses have probably asked in some form. Because on the face of it, the null hypothesis can seem kind of either contradictory or unnecessary. So the null hypothesis, for anyone who needs a reminder, is part of the hypothesis making step, which is null in the fact that it is saying nothing will happen. So whenever you're coming up with a an experiment to test some whatever it is you're researching that these two features affect one another or that the you know these things correlate with one another or that you know this thing happens when this thing happens whatever it is the null hypothesis saying no to all those things i just said they don't affect they don't correlate they don't happen because the other one happens right default assumption status quo and that's what the null hypothesis is is a default it's not meant to say that you're looking for those things not to happen and that's why it can often sound confusing because it sounds like you're look now you are aiming for nothing to happen what it is saying is If there is no significant results to this experiment, the null hypothesis should be that we don't notice any strange connections. We don't notice anything notable. This is uh, 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 this is in tandem with your hypothesis that you're doing the experiment for, that there is a connection. And so that's your testing. The null hypothesis is basically always present in all experiments that there's the chance nothing happens because there is no connection that you thought might have been there, that you hypothesized might be there. It's basically just a default in experimentation and statistics. Uh, for the other parts of the question as whether or not the researcher doing said experiment is the one that implements it or others do, the truth is basically everyone always implements it whenever they do an experiment. It just may not always be stated. Right. There's lots... It's the default position. You don't have yes. to state that you're factoring in it's sort of built in and there are some researchers who treat it a little more literally than others and definitely in classes i have had professors say state your null hypothesis yeah to kind of ingrain it in the student's mind of you need to remember that part of what you're testing is not just that something will happen but that something won't happen right a a possible result Mm -hmm. is that you won't get any different results which is therefore another hypothesis for this experiment yes i either hypothesize something will or will not happen and there's your two hypotheses so there's a lot of times that the null hypothesis will be discussed when you read a a paper or something but it's not going to be said as the null hypothesis you know it'll meanly it'll typically only be brought up if the null hypothesis turned out to be true right yeah and then our results showed that there was no connection well there's that's the yes. null hypothesis. The status quo is maintained. Mm-hmm. We, we we end pretty much exactly where we started with one more bit of evidence to say that that's where we belong. Yeah, so it's not that the null hypothesis is in opposition to positive results. It's just that it is always a factor right. whenever you're testing something. Indeed, I guess you might argue, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> that in that stromatolite study we talked about, sort of the assumption, well, the, the conclusion beforehand was, this is evidence of 
living organisms, we're going to test if that's true. Yes. If we find significant results that change that, the hypothesis being, well, we'll find evidence to the contrary. The null hypothesis, I suppose, in that case would be that we will find evidence that supports what we already learned. Yeah. Or would it be the null hypothesis is that we won't find evidence for what we're looking for? And that's that's where even I've heard discussions that uh, the the use of the null hypothesis can confuse studies sometimes because what it should be sometimes isn't always clear. Right. So I don't know if there is a simple, clean answer to situations like that. Like if I'm testing gravity, is my null hypothesis that the ball will fall or that the ball will do nothing when I let it go? Hmm. You know, and I've, I've heard discussion before that's, you know, about the fact that the null, null hypothesis sometimes is counterintuitive, which is why questions like this are actually very common. Yeah. When you're beginning the steps into research because it seems counterintuitive. Hmm. But that's why there's a lot of times where it's not just, it's not stated that way. It's just, and we all agree that there's a potential that we get no notable results. Right. Yeah. That right, right. You, you've not found anything new. Yes. And that's really what it is, is that you've not found anything that contradicts the current, as you said, the status quo, mm -hmm. the current understanding of those things. Uh, the skulls of the two New Guinea crocs are just New Guinea crocs. Right. They're the same. Nothing is notable between them when you compare them. Things have not changed. Yes. All right. Cool. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Cheryl, for Absolutely. asking the question. Hopefully that was helpful. Yes. Thanks to our requesters for requesting this topic. Hopefully we sated your interest. Thanks to all of our patrons for supporting us and to all of our listeners for listening. We release new episodes every fortnight. Yeah. Come back in a fortnight for episode 72 where we'll talk about whatever we talk about then. Get in touch with us to leave comments or questions or suggestions for future episodes in the social medias or the emails or all that. You can listen in the outro. We'll put out a blog post that'll go along with this episode where I'll put up maps to show you the Western Interior Seaway. Hopefully I'll be able to find good uh, free use maps, but I, I know where I can get at least one or two. So be sure to check that out. Lots yeah. of links and pictures. And I think that's it. Keep your ears out on Saturdays this month for spooky. our spooky episodes. It's going to there. We're going to be rolling them out. It's going to be super good. <laughs> and yeah, otherwise, thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Sign off, Race. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.